Hey everyone, Mecha here. Let's talk about Fire Emblem remakes. Specifically, the idea of combining two games into one remake. More specifically, the idea of combining a remake of Fire Emblem 6, The Binding Blade, with Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Blade. Now, I have made another video about combined remakes before, and I kind of wanted to talk about the FE6 and FE7 combination there, but I decided that if I merged these two things into one video, it would dilute the quality of both, so I decided to make this into a separate video instead. And I should do the same with these games, because combined remakes are a terrible idea, and we shouldn't want them. Yes, the same goes for FE6 and FE7, even though at first glance it doesn't look nearly as bad as FE4 and FE5. But it's still a bad idea. So first of all, remaking two games into one cartridge is just a lot harder to get right than one game into one cartridge. One game per release means that as a developer you have a budget for one game, and the consumer pays for one game. Everyone knows what the deal is. With two games into one it gets a lot more complicated. If they just charge double the price, say $120 instead of $60, then I think a lot less people will be inclined to buy it. People are risk averse and they're not as likely to spend that much money in one go. It is much more accessible if you have the option of buying one for 60 and then if you like it, you have the option of buying the other one for another 60 Of course, they could reduce the price to $90 for the package of two games, but then as a consumer you should not be expecting two full price games, because the people making these games cannot just work for nothing. You cannot pay less and expect the same quality. And if you're okay with reducing the quality of the games for the sake of reducing the price, well, let's just say I respectfully disagree with that. The same goes for waiting time. I am all for developers having all the time they need to make a good game the way they are planned, instead of having to scramble for a yearly release or something. But that means that for a combined remake to get the same amount of attention to detail as like two single releases, I have to wait twice as long to play my FE6 remake. I would rather just have them work on an FE6 remake first, however long that may take, and then while I play that, they get to work on FE7. Yes, I know it wouldn't literally take twice as long, as quite a few assets could be reused, but at the same time, I think there would be a lot of time spent on things that have to be done in a combined remake that wouldn't need to be done in a separate remake. In summary, separate remakes by default are easier to put a fair price on, more likely to sell better, and it's easier to bridge the development time between the two. It's better for consumers, and it's better for developers. Alright, now let's talk about the specific problems of FE6 and FE7 as a remake. Now, if you have seen my video on the Juke Troll remakes, you would know that a big problem I had with the idea of combining those is that FE4 and FE5 fit together very awkwardly. FE5 happens right in the middle of FE4's timeline, and both games play out differently with regards to what certain characters do and how certain events go. FE6 and FE7 are very different. FE6 takes place 20 years after the events of FE7, so they do not coincide at all. And this is exactly why there is absolutely no need for them to be remade together, they don't really intertwine, they are different adventures by different characters. Sure, the main characters are related, Roy is Eliwood's son, Lelina is Hector's daughter, but they are fighting different battles, it's not like they're really finishing what their parents had started in the way that Sigurd and Quan's kids did. I'm not going to delve into the details because I want people to watch these videos without getting spoiled, and yes, some people haven't played 20 year old video games and it's worth keeping videos accessible to those people in my book, but you cannot convince me that there's the same sense of legacy in the Alive games as there is in the Duke Roll games, you just can't. Part of the reason for that is because they were made very differently. FE4 Gen 1 and 2 were one game. FE7, however, is a prequel to FE6. FE6 was never made to have another game following it, it was made to be self-containing. FE7 is an addition to FE6's universe, but it barely adds anything to FE6's story, it just uses the same world and some of the same characters. FE6 doesn't really feel incomplete without playing FE7, it works well enough on its own. Let's compare this to say Tellius. FE9, Path of Radiance, is clearly set up to have a sequel, because some of its mysteries, minor or major, remain unresolved. The most important one, of course, being just who was the Black Knight. But it also has the obviously corrupt Benyon senators to deal with, as only Oliver was taken care of, and some of the player characters have motivations that have yet to be unraveled, like who Soth is looking for when he joins you on the ship. And indeed, all of those things are dealt with in Radiant Dawn. Whether it deals with all these equally well is questionable, but the point is, Radiant Dawn wasn't thought of after Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn was already clearly in conception when Path of Radiance was made. FE7, on the other hand, was clearly conceived after FE6, and as a result, it suffers. It really does. In fact, I made a gigantic 16-part video series analyzing and deconstructing on why FE7's story is so poorly thought out, and yet appears to be such a great adventure on your first viewing of it. It is a beautiful, yet horrific mess. 
Don't get me wrong, FE7 was my first Fire Emblem and to this day I love playing it and I love analyzing it, but it also contradicts both itself and FE6 many, many times and in hindsight it makes very little sense. Now there is no way I can properly back up this stance within the confines of this video. It took me basically 9 hours of scripted video to do so in the first place, but here is a quick rundown of the biggest offenders. Number 1. Nurgle and by extension Ephidel are terrible villains whose behavior often contradicts their motives. There are many times where their actions take them further from achieving their goals. This is hidden by the game making them look mysterious, but instead of any of the characters noting this, the game quickly moves on to the next point so that hopefully you forget about it. The timeline for many of the game's events just does not work out no matter how you put it. The most hilarious example of this is how Nurgle has all the necessary ingredients for his dragon summoning ritual sitting in his dungeon for half a year without doing anything, but another favorite misstep of mine is how Nino and everyone else seems to think that she's grown up in the Black Fang with the Reed family, even though there's also a lot of evidence that she grew up with Sonia and Nurgle. Number 2. King Desmond, the father of Zephiel, deploys the Black Fang to try and stop Zephiel's coronation. He has him steal the Fire Emblem so that the coronation can't happen, which the game basically tells us is enough to stop it completely, but just in case, he also deploys the Black Fang to murder Zephiel. You know, just in case. And since basically everyone, including Elliwood, Hector, Helen, and Murdoch, know that Desmond tried to do this, it makes them all look very silly for not warning Zephiel that his dad is trying to murder him. This is especially true for Helen, who loves Zephiel more than anyone else in the world. FE7 also contradicts the backstory of the desert village Nabada and its relationship to Athos as it was established in FE6. It also makes him use four blades at a point where it should logically be sealed away. In fact, the appearance of Athos and the several other ancient heroes of the past is a bit weird to say at least, since Elliwood and Hector apparently never brought it up with their kids. In fact, the entire events of FE7 with Nurgle, the Dragon's Gate and all the legendary weapons is apparently never passed on to Roy and Lolita, even though there are several characters present in both games that could have done so, such as Merlinus and Marcus. You would think that these details would be pretty important to tell Roy, and it's pretty hard to justify these characters just forgetting about them or not thinking they're worth bringing up. And just to be clear here, this is not a problem with FE6. In the FE6 universe, these things never happened. These problems only exist because FE7 made them into problems. If you disagree that they are problems, I recommend you delve into the Plinket Emblem series because I try to explain why they are in excruciating detail. I know it's a long watch and I know that the voice change I used isn't for everyone, but unraveling why exactly FE7's story is so poorly constructed simply takes a lot of time. So what I'm worried about is that FE7 is so riddled with problems that it's better off separate from FE6. I don't mind the idea of it being remade, but I want to keep it as far from FE6 as possible because FE6 is honestly a fine self-contained story. FE7 is nice and fun, but writing-wise it really drags down the Alive games as a whole. I don't hate it, but it's basically an FE6 fanfic. Now one argument I've heard for a dual remake is that it could be a great opportunity to fix the problems with FE7, but I really don't think the developers are aware that even half of the problems with FE7 exists or that they even want to fix these issues, because other than for professional internet nitpickers like me, they are really not big problems at all. As I said, on a first playthrough the storytelling of FE7 holds up fine, especially since a lot of the western audience experienced FE7 before FE6. But I think FE7's approach to storytelling, where the game makes a lot of questionable events look like mysteries only to then completely drop the plot point and move on to the next one, is a display of incompetence at worst and dishonesty at best, and I think Fire Emblem deserves better storytelling than that. And even if they wanted to fix the problems, I'm not sure they're able to with the writing team that they have. But even if they're aware of the problems, willing to fix them and capable of doing so, don't you think they would have an easier time doing this if they were able to focus all their efforts at FE7, rather than having to dedicate resources to the FE6 part of this combined remake? But okay, let's put aside the story for a moment. What about the characters? That's a big reason people want these combined remakes. They want to use the characters that appear in both games, and of course they want to pair characters together and have their choices influence the offsprings of those characters. Well, not to sound like a broken record, but FE6 and FE7 are just not the same as FE4 Gen 1 and 2. Let's count the relationships between characters in FE6 and FE7. Elliwood is Roy's dad. His mom is unknown, so that's fun for shippers. That's one. Hector is Lilina's dad. Her mom is unknown as well, so that's fun for shippers too. That's two. Wrath is Sue's dad, and her mom is unknown, so that's fun for shippers. That's three. 
Nino is pretty clearly Lou and Ray's mom. It's pretty obvious that the dad is supposed to be Jafar, but I guess Urk is a candidate as well, so I guess this one is fun for shippers too. That's four. And Rebecca is Walt's mom. That unknown, fun for shippers. That's five. Dayan is Wrath's dad, but FE7 happens before FE6, so you can't really do a pairing with any kind of a result in here. So that one doesn't count. Hawkeye already has a daughter during the events of FE7, so unless you want to make him remarry or something, there's no pairing fun to be had here. Kanaz is Yu's dad, but he's already conceived during the time FE7 happens, so no fun for shippers there. Kanaz is also the son of Nime, but I don't think anyone plays FE6 so that he compares themselves with Nime, right? Well, I'm sure some of you are into it, but either way, you're not going to be able to influence the kids by doing so. And then there's some more vague links, like how Geats is the brother of Geese, which again doesn't really give us anything. And lastly, we have the canonical pairings. Pent and Louise are the parents of Klein and Clarine, and Bartra and Carla are the parents of Fear. If you're someone who argues for a combined remake so you can break these pairings up and marry yourself and search to one of these pairings, fuck you. You're the worst. I'm sorry. Not sorry. And that's it. That's all the relations FE7 has to FE6 really, except for people like Karel, Myrnas, and Marcus being the same person. That's five characters you can pair, with generally one kit for each. It's not even close to the same thing as FE4, which is built around the generational system. So unless you start inventing family relationships with contrived ideas, like Wendy being the daughter of Sarah and Oswin or something, there just isn't too much to work with here. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to linking FE6 and FE7 in some way to satisfy people who enjoy this kind of thing. I'm not judging. I have weird fetishes too, like I enjoy beating maps in one turn sometimes, but why not use some kind of transfer system instead, like the Tellius games? Have your Switch take the save data from FE7 and then use it to influence your FE6 characters a bit, depending on what pairings you make, which units were trained, that kind of stuff. I don't have a problem with that. But having both games on one cartridge, I think that's something that makes no sense from a developer standpoint. And it also makes no sense to want it as a consumer. Just keep them separate, there are more ways to connect two games than by literally merging them. Now, there is one argument left that people sometimes bring up in favor of combined remakes, and that's the want to experience both games in succession, so that you can have an almost continuous experience of the story. Well, I have good news for you. You can already do this with the many current versions of the game, but not a lot of people seem to notice, so I asked my friend Sai and Yo to demonstrate how to do exactly that. Pay close attention.